Today I'm sharing a message titled, The Compelling Life of Jesus. The Compelling Life of Jesus. That scripture we read is the, is the record of, like we all said, the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem when he was definite that the last page of his earthly life was being opened before him. How many of you will go to work still happy, joyful, if you know that day you are going to be sacked at work? How many of you will go to work and face the consequence of how you have lived your life with a group of people and you know if you go there they are going to persecute you? Jesus had lived three and a half years preaching the gospel of Jesus that he got from heaven. And on that journey, he knew that he was about to face the consequence of preaching that gospel. And in fact, by the revelation of God and by the knowledge that he knew of God, he knew that he was entering Jerusalem physically alive, he knew he wasn't likely to come out of it physically alive. Yet he walked and faced that journey triumphantly. He didn't face it downcasted. He didn't, he didn't ride that, he didn't ride on that donkey expecting people to throw a pity party for him. He didn't ride on that donkey that day trying to gain people's attention that if, people, if there was an argument to say, but they shouldn't, they should, they shouldn't, he will have been saying to them, yes, I'm sure you know how good I have done. Jesus went on that final phase into Jerusalem triumphantly. My prayer for you today is regardless of what you experience, you will have a triumphant entry into every phase and stage of your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The compelling life of Jesus I check the additional meaning of the word compel. It says compel is to force or oblige someone to do something. Or perhaps to bring about something by the use of force or pressure. The synonyms to compel are force, coerce into, pressurize into, Pressure, impel, drive, press, push, urge, prevail on, and many more. Jesus lived a compelling life. And I tell you from the beginning, what I'm praying about today, as you listen to me share this message to you, is that you'll be determined like Jesus to live a compelling life. I am praying and I'm hoping that after you listening to this message, you'll be tired of living an ordinary life. An ordinary life is an unfruitful life. An ordinary life is an insignificant life. An ordinary life is a life that passes without a mark. An ordinary life is a life that is easily forgotten. An ordinary life is a life after you have long lived it and finished it, 
There's no reward for it. There's a poem called The Odyssey of Homer. I got a scripture, I mean not a scripture, I got a quote from it. It says, by, he by heaven's high will, compelled from shore to shore, with heaven's high will, prepared to suffer more. It says there is a will from heaven that compels me to go from shore to shore. There is also a will from heaven that will make me, even though I suffer, I will be suffer, I'll be ready to suffer more. Amen? Amen. How do you impact people so much and get them to do something that they will not have ordinarily done? How do you force people without forcing them? How do you impact on people so much that you pressure them without touching them to do something that they will never have thought they would do? Jesus compelled his disciples in that passage we read in Matthew 21, 1 to 11. He compelled his disciples to commandeer a donkey. Somebody said a colt that didn't belong to him. Do not say I said it, but it was more like stealing it. Oh, borrow it, somebody said. Because if somebody left their pen somewhere, and you went and picked it up without asking them. Don't forget, he didn't say, go to that place, knock the door of the house beside the tree, and ask for that donkey. He said, go there and untie the donkey and bring it to me. If anybody now asks you, why are you doing that? Why are you still in it? Why are you borrowing it without borrowing it? <laughs> say to them, the Lord is in need of it. What compels people to go to such an extent, to do what in some cases you can say is illegal, but yet when you tell them to do it, they're compelled to do it. The presence of Jesus, if you read in that verse 8 and 9, the presence of Jesus compelled people, compelled the multitude to gravitate towards him. Once the new Jesus was in town, guess what? Every football match shut down. It doesn't matter who was playing. The, the, the pubs are dried up. But do you know that that was once the story of this land? When the gospel of Jesus was being preached, Everywhere went a gog for him. The multitude came to hear him. The multitude came to listen to him. The multitude didn't just listen to him, they followed him. When he went on the hill, they went with him. When he went into the valleys, they went with him. Onto the mountains, they went in so much so that it was only when Jesus felt, I needed a bit of space. He would sneak off. More like look for time to be alone. They didn't just follow him on that triumphant journey into Jerusalem. The multitude spread their clothes. Imagine men taking off their suits on Oxford Street and spreading it on the floor and say, walk over me. Imagine ladies with their ferragamo and their gamofemo <laughs> attires spread it and lay it on the ground and say, walk over me, it doesn't matter. I defer to you. Designer or no designer, they were ready for Jesus to take a step over them. 
Multitude didn't just do that. They shouted and praised and sang his praises all day long. Hailing him and thanking him. What is the sort of thing that makes people do this? Or what is it that you could do that makes people to do this? My question to you today and to each and every one of us is, how compelling are you? How compelling are you? And the second question, just after that, is what are you willing to compel people to do? It is one thing to be compelling. It's another thing to compel people to do the right thing. The Bible talked to us about Jesus in Acts 10, 38. It says, how God, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Ghost, with the Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about doing what? Doing good and healing all that were oppressed. If you were supposed to be anointed this morning and given power, what will you compel people to do? The Bible said he went about doing good and healing people. I know a lot of people who have anointed and who have power and who have aura and who have influence. But guess what? They use it to oppress people. They use it to deprive people. They use it to suppress people. They use it to manipulate people. That is not the Jesus that we serve. The Jesus that we serve uses his power, his anointing, his glory, his awesome influence to love people and to make them do the same. Those who profess to be Christians and those who seek to be leaders like Jesus must show the same compelling nature like he did. You want to be a leader. What leader do you want to be? We all say we are Christians. What sort of Christians are we? One thing that is sad about life is that people love to be lied to. I'm going to repeat that. The saddest thing about life is that people, all of us, we enjoyed being lied to. Wake up one morning and find one or two people who you know will tell you, the way a friend of mine call it, the brutal truth about who you are. And ask them the way Jesus asked his disciples. Please, who am I? Who do you, by what you have known of me, who can you tell me that I am? Be frank with me. Be open to me. Parents, ask your children. Husband, ask your wife. Wife, ask your husband. Go to your neighbor and ask your neighbor, who am I? Politicians can ask the governor. It would be nice for a politician to ask and say, who am I to you? It's important to us Everyone, you know, it's been said that every single day we wake up, we have the ability to influence 10,000 people. Every 24 hours, each and every one of us here. Either by the way, you didn't talk to anybody, but the way you dressed, somebody will look at you from the bus 
I said, wow, look at how she matched that thing with, I had that kind of shoes, but I've never worn it like that before. You have influenced them. Because the next time they wore that shirt, they're being influenced by you, yet you don't even know them. Influence is a powerful weapon. Yet, we look at it and we play with it. We joke with it. What is the unique influence you have on people that will make them to have a compelling, positive influence in their lives to other people? Identify one thing about you that is so good, so unique. Because I believe there's nobody seated here and nobody listening to me that doesn't have a compelling attributes that it can make people to gain from them or through them. You don't need to touch people. You don't even need to know people. Be determined to want to influence them. But my question is, with what are you going to influence them? You could be the compelling positive influence to your children. And that's talking to parents. Yes, you were not, that was where you, how you were raised. You raised not to be organized. But please, Will you do the destruction of raising that little boy or girl not to be organized? You can change it. Don't say that is how we are in our family. No, you can refuse to change it. You can say, from today, I put a stop to that. That trend must come to an end. Why? Because you want to live a compelling life. You can be a compelling positive influence to your family, to your friends. Do you know there are friends that if somebody did something wrong in Birmingham, who did they look for first? All their friends. Even the one that is in London, they go and grab them. What if you have such an influence on your friends that even when your friends do something that is wrong and questionable, they say, no, 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 he doesn't belong there. She's not part of it. Why? Because you have set a rule about who you are. That everybody is doing it does not mean you have to do it. You can set a new order. You can set a new agenda. Why not be a compelling, positive influence at your place of work? <laughs> you know, go and ask your employer if you had an option, if your employer asked you, if we have an option to let you off or keep you, ask us what we would, what we would take and what would the, what's the option we would choose. Some of your employers, if they say to you, we can pay you to go, see your life. <laughs> but isn't it, wouldn't it be a blessing if you said you want to leave and your employer said, no way. Name your price, you are going nowhere. That was a testimony of Joseph. In Potiphar's house. Papa said, there was no way Potiphar would afford to let go of Joseph. In the real sense of things, forget about the shenanigan of Potiphar's wife. But he was the reason for the prosperity of Potiphar. He was the reason Potiphar had such a legendary success. 
what will be said of you? But you know what? You can be a positive influence to your spouse for those of us who are married. <laughs> you know, Tony and I have entered a new phase of our lives. In the sense that every single day I have purposed and both of us have purposed to find out how to really and genuinely love ourselves again. In the sense that I have so seen and experienced and imagined how this woman has touched my life. So touched my life that I don't think I can recover from it. That is so true. But I also know of a fact that it is impossible for her to recover from the way that God has used me to impact her life and touch her life. It is impossible. I don't think she can recover. Why? It was a deliberate effort. Not by forcing or physically restraining. You know, somebody came to me when I came back. I said, oh, what Pastor Tony spoke about you. It was so powerful. I said, I know. I said, I know. I know because I know she will have said it the way she knows it. If you ask me, if your husband say, tells you that I want to go and talk about you to somebody, what will you do? <laughs> I tell you, some people will have cardiac arrest, treats, cardiac arrest. But, but, but let me say the truth to you. That was where we started from in our ages of marriage. And those of us who we have shared our lives with in counseling, in marriage and in, in, in deliberation discussion, we spoke to you about the fact that in those days, we said to ourselves, you choose three people. And I choose three people in different areas of our lives. And we said to ourselves, these people are going to be the one that we defer to in this area of our lives. So we live our lives once anything happens, we try to resolve it, we try to settle it. Once it's becoming unresolvable, whenever I hear Tony said to me, I've been trying to book an appointment to see this person, to go and talk about this. I said, Don't, let us look at it again. <laughs> Those people became checks for our lives. But you know what? We have so done that this long. And I tell you, those people, we probably haven't gone to sit down with them for 20 years. We didn't need to. We have become those personalities to ourselves. Once Tony said to me that we need to talk, or once I said to him that I think we need to sit down and talk, the two of us know that we need to look at this thing critically. It is a deliberate step and a deliberate effort. Be a compelling positive influence to your neighbors, to your classmates, for those of us who are in school, to your colleagues, to the public. I mean, it will be a tragic experience for us being a church and we're in this hotel facility coming here every Sunday and Wednesday and if we go to ask the people who serve us that who are those guys if they cannot tell people about us in a good way we have failed But you know my testimony? 
my testimony is that I have gone to that reception before, or I've met people who have come to church here, and guess who sent them to church from the reception? They say, oh, they, do, you, do you know there's a church? We are now part of their facility. <laughs> that we're not just an hotel. We also provide church service. Even though they're not the one delivering it. <laughs> but that is a good testimony. That's a good testimony. When people are checking in, they say, oh, would you like to, on a Sunday morning, what do you do? I just like, we have a church on site. That is a good testimony. Wherever you go, you must be ready to leave a compelling impact on people's life that they will do what they would not have ordinarily done. Now listen, there's a cost to living a compelling life like Jesus. There's a cost. To live a compelling life like Jesus, you must be ready to give your life and probably lose your life for people. We did not say too far about that gallant effort about that, that policeman in France. You're a policeman. I mean to pro protect people. It's not written there that he had to do it, but he felt compelled to do it. To say, release one of those hostages and I will swap my life for her. And that policeman walked into his death while that lady walked out free from danger. Can you do that? Some of us can't even suffer for our children. The children you have, your, your, you give birth to them. When I say, can you suffer for your children? The kind of suffer is not the suffer to buy toys we are talking about. Suffer to give your life. For your husband, for your wife, for your friend. How, can, how compelling can you to your loved ones so much so that they know and they can testify that I am safe? Living a compelling life is an attraction to many people, but only few people dare to pay the price to live it. Can you pay the price of such an impact on people's life? Jesus died 2,018 years ago. We are still here praising and hailing him. People are still on the street there about to die for him. That is impact. Living a compelling life is, is a nature of God. And Jesus demonstrated it to us. He said to us in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 to 30, I'm going to take a little, maybe about seven more minutes out of time today. He says in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 to 30, he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me. Take my yoke upon A yoke is a burden. A yoke is a weight. A yoke is something that is not, is not so good, but it says, I have a yoke. I have a burden. What is the burden you have? He says, now take it and learn of me. If Jesus is asking you to do something, he has already done it. Every leader asking people to do something must have done it 10 times. If you can't do it, forget it. You're not a leader. Don't say, do it as I say, don't do it as I do. No, 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 that's, that's a wrong statement. Anything you want people to do, you must do it, demonstrate it. It says, my, my, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest. Say, for my yoke is easy, 
easy to bear, but my burden is light. The only thing that makes a burden to be light is when you are in agreement to carry the, the yoke. I mean, if we demonstrate it, to carry, who, who's into physics here? You, you teach physics, era. Yes, isn't it? Business. Oh, you, I thought you taught sciences. Oh, social sciences. Oh, like me. Okay. Okay. Who teaches real sciences? <laughs> you, you know, okay. Okay. You, you know, what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to gear out is, I don't know what it is, but in the in motion, motion is one of the topics in physics. I can say, I did physics up to when I could not cope anymore. <laughs> now, emotion, emotion, what, what increases the level of the motion is when everything is going in sync in the right direction. Once there's an obstruction, that motion is, of course, obstructed. Are you getting me? I don't know what it's called, but if you want to carry this lectern, in that direction. If it's two of us carrying it, or is it four of us carrying it, as long as we are, the, all of us are moving in the same direction, we'll have a good consistent flow. As long as one of us change their mind and say this, that direction is not where I'm going, and begin to apply brake, <laughs> there's a problem. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. Are you in agreement with God about your life? Because many of us are not in agreement with God. That's why there's this friction. You're not in agreement with the people you say you are the same boss with, yet you are going the same direction. I want to confuse the driver. The driver is already put there where the bus is going. And they must get there. Even if they're going to go in either direction. Don't confuse the driver to go your way. Living a compelling life that is like an example is sacrificial. If you want to do it, you must be ready to sacrifice your life. Sacrifice your time. Sacrifice your resources. Sacrifice your pleasure. Sacrifice your earthly, earthly gain. You may imagine it. I once met a an 80-something-year-old man who said to me that life is so bad now that himself and his wife, they, are still, they were still alive then, they decided that what they have saved up as inheritance for their children, said they decided that they are going to spend it until they die. Said they will finish it. Yeah. They told me. The, the man told me. Uh -uh. He said, yes. He said, we will finish it. Guess, guess the reason. Guess the reason. He said, life has become, life has changed from what it used to be. So when we are growing up, we defy and help our children and our parents. We honor them. Now the children are waiting for the man to die. <laughs> they are going to the hospital not to go and help the man to get well. They want to find out. Ah, how is he? How is he? <laughs> Still alive. Okay, okay. I tell you something. It is important for us to know that everything we do in life has consequences. Will you be ready to sacrifice something for somebody? Matthew 6, 19 to 20. 
It says, don't store up treasure here on earth for yourself. But heaven, store up treasure for yourself in heaven. Where it cannot be tampered with, where it cannot be destroyed. To live a compelling life, you must be ready to, trans, to live a transforming life. Matthew 12, 2. You know, if you want to live a compelling life that people can emulate, you have to be genuine. You can't fake it. You can't fake it. If you fake it, you'll be found out. Thank God we, we did the topic love this morning. You know you can't fake love. Some of you say, I love you, I love you. I know you love that person you say you love because of what you're going to get out of it. Love is a decision. That's why love cannot be rested on feeling and all those kind of things. No, 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 no. The love that Jesus gave to us, he said, while we are yet sinners, he did what? He died for us. That's why he said to us, if somebody slapped you, turn the other cheek. He didn't say, turn the cheek if the slap was not hot. If you love somebody, regardless of what they did, you love them. In fact, you love them more. What is your aim? You want to love them into submission. Love them into submission that they will not be afraid. Oh, yes. You so love somebody and anything you want to do, they're watching you to say, I don't even know what. I mean, they are fragile. Why? Because you are gaining ground. Do you know and I once know a couple who were believing God for full of the womb, and the husband told the wife, I don't want you to pray in this house again. We are going for IVF. This God, if he wants to do it, he will have done it. So to book an appointment with the girl to say, we will pray every 3 a.m. Every 3 a.m. we will pray. So when the guy was irritated, he said, no more prayer in this house. So Toy told the lady, we will pray. You just, once you wake up, I'll wake up. And then we pray. You can be in silence and pray. Just sit down there. Do you know, it didn't take time. Once the lady woke up, the guy wakes up. They sit down there, and they believe at each other. The only thing that gave it up was one day the lady called to him and they were praying and when they were praying the man too was saying amen. He joined in. You can love somebody into submission. Guess the testimony of that thing. The, the day they went for IVF in session, they found the lady pregnant with twins. With twins. The twins about, they're about Maybe 13 years old now. In this same London. Not far. In fact, in Hillingdon. Yes, in Hillingdon. Miracles still happen in Hillingdon. Amen? You can make a compelling impact on people's lives. If you want to live a compelling life, be ready to be fruitful. Do you want to be fruitful? Every tree that is not fruitful will be cut down. The reward of living a compelling life is priceless and is fulfilling. If you see a journey, the journey of a diamond from the rubble, from mining, look rough like stones, but the passage through the fire brings the best out of it. So the same diamond by the time it's showcased in display, it's different. Are you 
allow you to go through what it takes to make an impact in people's life. So many people are self-dependent on themselves as a source of livelihood, but never realize that only in giving their lives to other people can their livelihood be provided and sustained. I'll close by repeating that statement we started with. I want you to be tired of living an ordinary life. An ordinary life is not worth a life to live. There are people you as a person can compel today to live a life that can change the whole world. And my prayer is that you will be ready to do that. Amen. Let's bow down our heads and pray. It's Palm Sunday. It's very close to Easter. And there will always be a Palm Sunday. Next year there will be another one. But there was once a Palm Sunday that happened 2018 years ago that set the pace for today. Why? Because a man called Jesus, he decided he was going to impact on people's lives. He was going to set an example that will transcend generations and that will transcend millennia. So much so that people will go ahead and live for him and live for God. Why not make a decision today that you are going to live differently? I don't know how many people are here who say they are Christian, but they are not necessarily yet totally giving up and agree with God. So that that yoke can be easy for them to carry. If there's any such person today, I want to just pray for you. You want to genuinely surrender your life to God. Any, any such person. You've professed it. You've said it, but you haven't totally considered it. But you can do that today. And it's just a prayer. Any person that can do that. In 30 seconds. For all of us, Father God, I commit every single person here unto your hands. You made us with purpose. You designed us with an agenda. Father God, help us to live and glorify you with our lives. Father, we give you praise and honor. In Jesus' mighty name. You add us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and visit the church website.